Saturday evening, I went to Seaside Cafe. At night, the lights of the cafe spilled out through the windows. There were no other customers, only the lady sitting in the window, resting her face on her hand. I could tell she'd already finished her studying. I went in the cafe, but the ladies stayed closed. But the lady's eyes stayed closed. The cafe's lights shone on her cheek. She seemed even paler than usual. On the table was a book called Through the Looking Glass. This was the book the Jabberwock appeared in. Until she woke up, I sat and read. I saw the picture of a boy with a sword fighting the Jabberwock for the first time. If something like this was really living in the forest with, like the lady had suggested, even I would be at my wit's end. I could see no path to victory. I opened my notebook and copied the drawing of the Jabberwock. I think I did a pretty good job. At last, the lady's eyes fluttered open. Sorry, kiddo. Guess I nodded off. Are you still sleepy? I definitely need more sleep at night. Keep having scary dreams. What sort of dreams? The lady dreams are detailed below. She was sitting on the couch in the dentist's waiting room, like always. There was a light on at the reception desk, but no one was there. The waiting room was dimly lit, only the pale blue light of dawn streaming in through the window. There was something wrong with the potted plants in the corner of the room. It was like a plastic tube was growing out of the pot. The end of the tube widened like a trumpet. For some reason, the lady knew this was a plant that had no long, that had long ago gone extinct. There was someone else sitting with her on the couch. At first, the lady thought it was me, but the person sitting there was taller, like a grown-up. Their body was pale, wet, and glistening. She couldn't make out their face. The lady said it was a jabberwock. The jabberwock was muttering something. It sounded like tiny bub bubbles popping, and she couldn't work out any words. The lady thought she wanted to leave the waiting room, but she couldn't because no one would call for her. Dreams like that. Nasty, right? What are you waiting for, then? I don't know. I remember dreaming about the lady. The dream where she was standing at the Cambrian period sea, where she turned a stone into a blue whale. You've got some weird dreams, too. I can't make blue whales. She fell silent for a while, eyes focused on nothing. You look sleepy, I said. Mm -hmm, I am. Then we'd play chess. I talked about what I'd read in Through the Looking Glass. It's a world all about chess. That's why I thought you should read it. Alice start, starts out as a pawn, but ends up as a queen. I'd rather be a knight. Scheming to leapfrog yourself into adulthood. The lady was the one teaching me to play chess, but she was also unfortunately prone to making wrong moves. Whenever she picked up a piece, I had to watch carefully. For the sake of her honor, let me state for the record that she was not trying to cheat like Suzuki did. She could just be careless sometimes. The lady did not seem to be in great shape tonight, so I was concerned. I wondered if her state of mind was connected to the penguin emergence. One potential hypothesis was that producing penguins made the lady's well-being deteriorate, especially considering the question of the penguin energy discovered through Yuchida's experiment. The exact process was a mystery, but perhaps the penguins were living off the lady's energy. Maybe you shouldn't make any more penguins, I said softly. Why not? Maybe that's making you feel like this. Oh? I don't know. But I really like making penguins, she smiled. What was it you wanted me to make? Bats. Blue whales would be too big. They'd crush us. But I'm serious. I'm worried about you. Thanks. Just then, the lights in the seaside cafe went out, plunging us into darkness. I didn't know what was happening. The lady whispered, What's going on? It was dark in the street outside. Yamaguchi had been behind the counter cleaning up, and I heard him say, Power outage? Are you scared, Ayama? The lady asked. Her voice in the darkness felt extremely comforting. I'm not scared of powder power outages, but they do make me sleepy. Humans can't handle darkness. If I were a bat, I'd be fine. I would be able to see with sonar. 
I tried to make out the lady's face through the darkness, but no matter how hard I strained my eyes, I saw nothing. I peered patiently into the darkness, not moving, and felt a faint breeze brush against my face. I slowly looked up. The wind appeared to be originating from the above from above the chessboard. There's a strange phenomenon occurring, I said. I noticed that myself. The wind from above the chessboard was getting stronger. Eventually, there was a popping sound, like a bunch of large bubbles bursting. This made the wind get even stronger, and something came out of the chessboard, flapping its wings. The lady yelped and bent over backward, and Yamaguchi yelled, What the? I just sat there, stunned, feeling one black gale after another fly out of the chessboard. The power outage end ended, and the lights turned on. There was not a single piece left on the chessboard, but there was a ton of bats on the ceiling around the model of the blue whale. How'd they get in here? Yamaguchi exclaimed. The lady seemed equally surprised. I did it, she whispered. How did that happen? How did that happen? I don't know. It's your job to figure this out, she said. I see. She reached out and hooked her pinky in mine. That was the first time I'd ever touched her fingers. They felt totally different from when they were in my mouth at the dentist's office. They felt so thin and fragile, like they could break at any moment, and as cold as glass. On Sunday, my whole family went to the mall. The shopping mall was built after we moved here. On weekends, it filled with people from all over the neighborhood, like an amusement park. It was always shiny, like Legos, and it was very large. There were cafes, restaurants, boutiques, electronic stores, bookstores, even a movie theater. It was like an entire town in one building. I bet future space stations will be like this. We split into two pairs, my sister with my mother and me with my father. We agreed to meet at the restaurant on the top of the floor in one hour. My sister was excited about getting some new clothes. My father and I went to the stationery store. I like stationery supplies. We came here about once a month. I'd stare at compasses and rulers, notebooks in all colors, and completely lose track of time. My father always had a large notebook at hand, in which he wrote all manner of things. Sometimes he just doodled. My father really liked that notebook and would even look through it in the living room at home. He always took it with him when he went to the seaside cafe. If I wanted to be like my father, I should always have a notebook with me. That's why I was so happy when he first bought my, when he first bought me a grid-lined notebook and taught me how to use it. I was sure this meant I would one day be as important as he was. I used a spiral-bound notebook with a grid printed in light gray lines. It was smaller. It was smaller than the one my father used, which made it easier to carry everywhere. The paper was slightly thicker than average and very smooth. I could write a lot of words in ballpoint pen without my hand getting tired. It was a lot of fun to write things in a good notebook. That's why I took notes on everything. This notebook is the reason I'm so much smarter than your average elementary school student. Which do you want? My father always bought the same notebook, so I did too. We checked the bookstores, then went to the restaurant on the top floor. While we waited for my mother and sister to arrive, I took the new notebook out of the bag and flipped through the empty pages. These pages would soon fill up with discoveries and research and ideas. I was excited thinking of all the research research results that would soon be recorded here in my handwriting. I wanted to write something in it right away. I looked out the restaurant window. The woods behind the shopping mall had been cleared away and there were plots of land laid out. I could see the drain Uchida and I had followed. I'd seen it every time we left the mall. But if Uchida and I hadn't followed it, I would never have noticed it was there. I still had a lot to learn. Dad, imagine there was a really hard problem. Hmm, okay. My father said, smiling. I'm imagining a really hard problem. In this case, we want to use your three principles. Right. Break down the problem into smaller pieces, change the way you look at it, and look for a similar problem. Right. But after you do that, are there times you still don't understand? Of course. There are more ways to think about things. Lots of approaches. For example? My father thought about it, then took out his new notebook. 
He flipped through the pages like he was reading something important written in it, saying, For example, if you go home and try to turn on the light, you flip the switch but nothing happens. That's a problem. If that happened, what would you think? That the switch is broken. Maybe it is. If you think that, then the problem becomes the switch is broken. But what if there's actually a power outage, like last night? Then the problem has nothing to do with the switch. Yet, because you think the switch is broken, you can investigate the switch all you like and never find an answer. Because the problem isn't with the switch. So first, you need to identify what the problem actually is. I'd check to see if the lights in the other rooms work. That's one method. If the other lights don't turn on, there might be a problem with the circuit breaker, but this might not solve the problem. In that case, you'd have to check the neighbors' houses, and as you continue looking into it, you get a better idea of what the problem actually is. That makes sense. This is the most important thing, but also the hardest. With math problems, you have the problem written down in front of you, but in most cases, you have no idea what the problem really is. It's easy to end up accidentally investigating the switch while having no idea there's a power outage. You make mistakes too? Of course I do. Everyone does, my father said softly. When you try to figure out what the problem is, you're often wrong about it several times. But the, most, but the more practice you have, the better you get at finding the real problem. I wrote this down in my new notebook. I had to get to know the problem better. 1. Why could the lady make penguins out of Coke cans? 2. Why could the lady make bats out of chess pieces? 3. Why could the lady make penguins and bats sometimes and not other times? 4. What is penguin energy? 5. Is the lady's ability related to her physical state? June arrived with no significant progress on my penguin highway research. School was peaceful, there was no standout conflicts with Suzuki and his friends. It seemed like his group had gotten interested in exploring, using the map they'd stole from us. They talked about the map in class as if things on it were their discoveries. When he, when he heard Suzuki had formed an expedition party and followed the drain like we had, Uchida was dejected. But after listening a little more, we discovered that Suzuki's party had headed in the opposite direction of where we had gone. No problem, then. They went downstream, no risk of running into them. But it isn't fair. We're the ones who found that stream. Uchida, we are searching for the source of the water. We can't explore in both directions at the same time. Suzuki's party can explore all they want to. You really don't get mad, Ayama. Not if I think about breasts. I definitely wanted to find out where the drainage canal led for myself. But... I had a lot of other research projects on my plate already. No matter how smart I was, it was a mistake to take too much. Take on too much. Handling both Project Amazon and the Penguin Highway research was more than enough for someone my age. And I was also doing research on the Suzuki Empire. I was better off leaving them be for now. I chose to believe that if we could make friends with them later, our map would be enriched as a result. Amamoto played chess with everyone in class and defeated every challenger but me. She was extremely smart and good at chess, and I was extremely smart and good at chess. So when we played, the entire class gathered around. Even Suzuki was secretly watching us. My knights were very active. When Hamamoto's hands stopped moving like a chocolate factory robot and actually paused, the entire class gasped. I heard Suzuki whisper, Get her in there. Shh, be quiet. Hamamoto said, holding up a finger. Suzuki shut up. She glared down at the chessboard. Her fingers were always pale, but today they were flushed. She brushed her chestnut hair out of her eyes. She was like a chocolate lover given a chocolate assortment, hovering over the chessboard as if to decide which piece to eat first. To be strictly accurate, I only won because Hamamoto made a careless mistake. Either of us could have easily emerged victorious. That's how tense a match it was. I really enjoyed it, and I think Hamamoto did too. After all, when the match was over, she didn't look frustrated. Instead, she smiled, her face still red, and held out her hand for me to shake. We were worthy rivals. 
Ayama, we should play again. Okay, I said. When I was playing chess with a lady at Seaside Cafe, I told her about our battle. After all, she was the one who had taught me to play chess, so I thought she might praise me for it. But instead, she said, you should have let her win. Not very grown-up of you, kiddo. Well, I'm not a grown-up, I argued. Don't pretend to be a child only when it suits you. You're letting me win right now. Every time we met up, she asked how the Penguin Highway research was going, just to mess with me. She teased me so mercilessly about it that I found myself suspecting she really did know all the answers and was just keeping them from me. But even if I thought I, but even if I thought that, I never said it out loud. I knew if I did, she'd definitely get mad. Kiddo, can you solve this mystery? You sure you're not just having fun at my expense? I totally am. Is that a problem? This is a very difficult matter. My research will take time. Oh, but please try to hurry, the lady said. If you don't solve the mystery, I won't take you to the beach. The lady came from a town on the coast. It was right up against the water, with mountains crowding behind it, so the whole team was built on a hill. So the whole town was built on a hill that sloped down to the sea. The lady had grown grown up looking down at the ocean from a house high above it. A sea breeze coming in the window, her bookshelves and clothes were always smelling like the ocean. That's why, she said, her body smelled like the sea. I once got her to let me sniff her arm. It smelled good, but I couldn't be sure it smelled like the sea. Unfortunately, I'd never been there. I'll take you someday, she said. Her father and mother lived there in the coastal town, and apparently they'd love it if she brought me. So we had promised to go one day. Life was born from the sea. So, as a representative of humankind, I wanted to research the ocean someday. This year, I had heard about a new railroad line. The train route was being extended across the mountains on a prefectural border. There would be a new station in our town. It was still in the planning stages, and there was no telling when it would be completed, my father said. But when I had heard this railroad would connect to the town where the lady was born, I was very happy. It would make going to the sea with her a lot easier. When we were playing chess on one time, I told her about the new railroad. If we take that train, we'll be at the sea in no time, the lady said. That'll make this a seaside town. It would, I thought. At the time, I'd just started playing chess with the lady, and the cafe we'd played chess in wasn't yet named the Seaside Cafe. Back then, Yamaguchi had given it a difficult name in some foreign language that I couldn't even pronounce. The lady couldn't pronounce it either, and neither could my father. That's how hard it was. If the train came here and this became a seaside town, then this cafe would be a seaside cafe. And because of that, the lady changed the cafe's name to Seaside Cafe. At first, it was just me and the lady who called it that. After he heard us calling it that, Yamaguchi hung the model of the blue whale from the ceiling, making the new name seem more appropriate. Everyone in town started calling it the Seaside Cafe. The sign outside the cafe still showed the really hard foreign name, but by now, everyone had forgotten about that sign. Why Seaside Cafe? People sometimes asked, and I would tell them about the new train, and that would take us as, and that would make us a seaside town. Logically, that meant this town was also by the sea, I'd insist. Uchida had moved here from a town across the prefecture line, but he still had a friend back there. He sometimes called that friend and wrote letters. I looked it up, and to get where Uchida used to live required crossing the prefecture border on one train, then transferring to a different line. It was over an hour away from where we lived. Uchida said he wanted to show the penguin to his friend in that town. Uchida had never taken a train alone, and carrying a penguin all the way alone would be a challenge, so I decided to help him. On Sunday, I went to Uchida's apartment building and found him waiting with a dog carrier he'd borrowed from someone in class. The penguin was waddling around the roof. It was hot and humid, but the penguin seemed fine. I knelt down, observing it, and it didn't seem to be losing strength at all. Uchida said the penguin hadn't eaten anything in over three weeks. The mystery of the penguin energy only deepened. If I could discover a way to make use of penguin energy, I would likely win the Nobel Prize. I'd be the first person in the, to win a Nobel Prize in elementary school. 
Uchida spread out his hands, and the penguin came waddling over. He'd really liked Uchida. We put the penguin in the pink carrier. I touched the penguin's black wings as we did this. They were as hard as asphalt, which surprised me. The penguin's back was covered in down, was covered in down, much softer and less slippery than I'd imagined. Penguins are clever, so it didn't struggle in the carrier. It just sat still. I'm sure this is going to be great, Uchida said. For your friend? Mm-hmm. It'll be awesome to see a penguin. My friend's in the hospital, so even going to the zoo is impossible. Is it because of an illness? Yeah, I don't know with what. But my friend's have been in the hospital a long time. If this makes them not happy, I'll be glad. On the bus to the station, Uchida kept pulling his fingers into the carrier. The penguin would peck his fingers with its beak. Maybe this kept it relaxed. Don't worry, just hang in there, Uchida said. It was my job to buy tickets at the station. When I bought the tickets and gave Uchida his, he was impressed and said, You're like my dad, Ayama. But I just knew how to do it and had never ridden a train on my own before. It was a clear day and the train interior was well lit. What's your friend like? We used to live in the same building, like you and my friend. Or, like you, my friend read a lot of books and liked researching things. Knew a lot about all kinds of things, not just penguins. Perhaps also interested in space? Like black holes? Yep. I hope the two of you become friends. Were you lonely when you moved? I was, until I started exploring with you. I really wanted to go back. And now? Part of me still wants to, and part of me doesn't. We watched the town go by through the train windows. We were moving away from home at incredible speeds. Japan is really big, I thought. My father and Achita's father both rode this train to get to work. The town around the station petered out, and I could see rice paddies and bamboo groves. The train stopped at two stations and then went into the tunnel under the mountains on the prefecture border. The tunnel was really long and dark. It amplified the noise of the train. Uchida peered into the carrier, worried. Ayama, the penguin's laying down. I looked, too. The penguin was curled up at the bottom of the carrier. Is it train sick? What do we do, Ayama? Let's get off at the next station. If you get car sick, you get better if you get off the car and lie down a while. Let's give it some time and see if it's alright. We got off at the next stop. I'd never gotten off at this station before. The platform was elevated, and we could look down at the bus terminal surrounded by small buildings. Behind the bus terminal was a small shopping area and then houses. I could see cumulonimbus clouds forming. There was a green forest to the north of the platform. The forest's green seemed to be tumbling toward the station. The train pulled away, and the station was empty. We put the carrier down on the edge of the platform and monitored the penguin's condition. I hope it's okay, Uchida said, worried. It seemed so happy before. Sorry, I don't know what could have caused this. It's okay. This isn't your fault, Ayama. I'm the one who insisted we should bring it. Uchida's voice got smaller and smaller. His eyes never left the penguin. As he stared down at the carrier, his bangs were fluttering. The wind was blowing. That's weird, I thought. There was no wind on the platform, and none of the trees north of the station were moving at all. Only Uchida's bangs. I licked my finger and tried to confirm the wind's direction. I moved my finger all around until I was sure the wind was coming from the carrier. Uchida? What? Back up a bit. When Uchida moved back, I made sure the station attendants weren't looking and opened the carrier. The penguin staggered out, looking very unhappy. The black of its back was all wrinkled. The wings hung limp at its sides, like it was too tired to flap them, as though all it could manage was to stand upright and keep its balance. The penguin's beak turned toward Uchida, and it squeaked. A moment later, all the shiny down covering it stood on end, starting from its feet and rising toward its head. Like a tsunami lifting the feathers, a spiral running around its body. The penguin raised its beak so high, it made it seem like it was swallowing a fish, stretching its body toward the sky expectantly. 
The wind resembled a tiny tornado. I grabbed Uchida's head, shielding him from the gale. The next thing I saw was a Coke can with wings flying through the air. The wings shrank like deflating balloons, vanishing completely by the time it landed on the platform. The wind was gone in an instant. The Coke can made a heavy clunk as it landed, echoing across the deserted platform. The penguin was nowhere to be seen. I was stunned. Uchida said nothing. I walked over, picked up the Coke can, and investigated it. It was cold, as if it had just come out of a vending machine. Cold enough, the drops of water on the outside moistened my fingertips. Only did I finally remember what had happened to the penguins on the rock on the truck. The first time they'd appeared in town, I named this phenomenon the penguin evaporation. I added the following line to my notes on the subject. Why do penguins evaporate when they ride trains? All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the first chapter, episode one, Seaside Cafe. I know that took a lot of videos, but I'm working through it. But I'm going to go ahead and post the first chapter. So if you like what you're hearing, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.